In today's video, we'll discuss Lori Markkinen, and we'll even go over his career as a whole just to see how he transformed into an all-star. But before we start, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more content just like this. Now, without further ado, let's get started. In 2017, the Minnesota Timberwolves selected Lori Markkinen with the seventh pick in the 2017 draft, but then he was quickly traded to the Chicago Bulls for Zach Levine and Chris Dunn. Lori played just one season in college for the Arizona Wildcats, where he averaged 15 points and seven rebounds while shooting 43% from three and 83% from the free throw line. Now, in his pro debut with the Bulls, he scored 17 points and grabbed eight rebounds against the Toronto Raptors. And even though they lost the game, things were looking bright for him and the organization. In his second pro game against the Spurs, he scored 13 points and got 12 rebounds. But unfortunately, the Bulls lost that game by 10 points. By the end of the season, he averaged 15 points, seven and a half boards, and one assist, while shooting 43% from the field and 36% from three on six attempts per game. So things were looking good for the rookie. He was even named the first player in 18 years to record 1,000 points and 500 rebounds in a single season. He also set an NBA record earlier in the season on October 24th for the most three-pointers in the first three games of an NBA career with 10 three-pointers. Although he didn't win Rookie of the Year, he was announced on the All-Rookie First Team alongside notable names such as Jason Tatum, Kyle Kuzma, Donovan Mitchell, and Ben Simmons. And even though he had a great rookie season with the Bulls, they finished a bad 27-55 and record. Before the start of the next season, he suffered an elbow injury in practice and was sidelined for six to eight weeks. When we came back, he would get an increase in minutes, going from 29 minutes per night to 32. This was a great idea because his numbers improved from the year prior. He wrapped up his sophomore season, finishing the year averaging 18 points and 9 rebounds while shooting 43% from the field and 36% from 3 on 6.4 attempts per game. Laurie was the second leading scorer on the team behind Levine and was first in rebounds, so he was productive in almost every aspect of the game. While his numbers increased, the Bulls seemingly got worse when they finished the season 22-60. and 60. In his third year in the NBA, things weren't looking good at all. His shot attempts went down that season from 15.3 in year 2 to 11.8 in year 3, and he would often find himself tucked away in the corner and would sometimes not even be on the floor down the stretch during critical moments. He'd be taking a lot of threes while barely getting to the the rim, which really hurt his efficiency. Markkinen was 42.5 from the field and a mere 34.4 from three, which were both career lows. Laurie was even asked about his struggles, and he said this, quote, I had 80 touches per game the past two seasons. This season, the touches dropped to 40. Don't get me wrong, I had some plays drawn with me in mind, but it's just different. When I spoke with Jim, we talked about how I should concentrate on getting rebounds and then leading the fast break, but it's just really hard getting 40 defensive rebounds. Next season, his fourth in the league would be his last season in Chicago, and he would average a career-low 13 points per game while also averaging his lowest number of minutes, 25. While the Bulls had an okay season with a 31-41 and record, they of course missed the playoffs. But now, Markkinen was a free agent, and after the issues with his touches and minutes per game, it was hard to think he would be in a Bulls jersey again in 2021 and he wouldn't. Laurie was traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers in a sign-and-trade agreement that sent Larry Nance Jr. to the Portland Trailblazers while the Bulls received Derrick Jones Jr. In Laurie's first season in Cleveland, he averaged 14.8 points per game while shooting 44% from the field and 35% from three. The unique thing about this season is how the Cavaliers chose to run a three-big man lineup with Markkinen at small forward, Evan Mobley at power forward, and Jarrett Allen at center. Honestly, it worked for the most part, mainly due to Markkinen's versatile offensive game. He could drive and shoot the three pretty good. And the even better part is that the Cavs finished the season 44 and 38, but unfortunately, despite the phenomenal season, they missed the playoffs after losing both of their games in the play-in tournament. You gotta remember, they weren't even expected to get remotely close to the playoffs that season. The previous season, they were 22 and 50. So the huge jump in play gave Cleveland the idea to sweeten their playoff chances the following season. And as you know, Lori Markkinen wasn't a part of that idea. The Cavs traded Markkinen, Colin Sexton, and Ochai Obaje in exchange for Donovan Mitchell. Yes, Markkinen had a good season, but Mitchell was an electric all-star who was averaging 26 points per game, proving to be one of the best scorers in the entire league. So the Cavs organization felt zero hesitation and pulled the trigger on the trade immediately. But just as it looked like it was going in the negative direction for Markkinen's career, things took an unexpected turn. 
But before we go into detail about the unexpected turn, let's first go over the Jazz's roster after they traded both Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. Their starting point guard was Mike Conley, a 35-year-old veteran whose scoring and assist numbers dropped from the year prior. And no, we're not saying he's a bad player or anything like that, but a 35-year-old Mike Conley isn't expected to bring you to the promised land. Their shooting guard was Colin Sexton, who had just tore his ACL the season before and definitely wasn't seen as an all-star. Then you had Jordan Clarkson, a really good scorer in the mid-range and pain area, but coming off a bad three three-point shooting year, and he plays little to no defense. Then you have bench players like Malik Beasley and Talon Horton, who are talented, especially Beasley, but they aren't going to lead you anywhere, if we're being honest. Then, of course, Jared Vanderbilt, who's an elite rebounder and defender, but has an extremely limited offensive game. So realistically, they were going to be tanking. And that wasn't a problem at all. They had just traded both of their stars, and of course, there's a generational draft prospect named Victor Wimbenyama. So who wouldn't want to tank for them? Well, apparently not the Jazz. They started off the season hot, winning their first three games in a row. Marketing scored 24 and 31 points in his second and third game during their short winning streak. Then, on November 18th, Laurie Markkinen had an amazing game and scored 38 points against Devin Booker and the Phoenix Suns on 11 of 18 shooting from the field, 2 for 3 from the 3-point line, and 6 for 8 at the free throw line. He also chipped in 6 rebounds and 3 assists while being a plus 5 on the court. The Jazz pulled through with a win, winning 134-133. to Markkinen then followed up that performance with a 23-point game against the Portland Trailblazers on November 19th. He shot 7 for 13 from the field and 3 of 5 from the line, and with the combined effort of his himself, Clarkson, and Malik Beasley, they beat Portland 118-113. to They were rolling and taking the league by storm, and by November 19th, they were 12-6 in the Western Conference. Fast forward to right now, and they're currently 12-11 after recently going on a five-game losing streak. Before you decide to get off the Jazz hype train, it's important to note that two of those losses were only by seven points, and one of those games were lost by only one point. So it's not like they're all of a sudden getting blown out and dominated, they're just in a slump. And after seeing their next 10 upcoming games, it will really show just what they're made of. But back to the topic at hand, Laurie Markkinen. As of now, he's ranked fourth among all power forwards in points per game, averaging 22. He's also 10th in three-point shooting percentage among power forwards, but he takes more threes than any of the nine players in front of him. So that shows just how efficient and consistent he is behind the line. The seven-footer is shooting 52% from the field and 81% from the line. He's just a really efficient player whenever he's on the court. But why is he so good? And how did he evolve into an all-star caliber player? The answer to that? He didn't evolve much, if we're being honest. But yes, of course, he obviously has improved since his rookie year, but it's nothing drastic. The reason he's having so much success is because of two things, freedom and attitude. First, let us explain freedom. Markkinen has always had great scores or a star around him. In Chicago, he had Zach Levine, especially in his final two seasons. And in Cleveland, he had Darius Garland and, of course, the two big men who operated in the paint, Jarrett Allen and Mobley. This sort of stunted his growth in a way. As Levine got more ball dominant, that forced Laurie to spend more time off the ball and more possessions just standing around in the corner. And in Cleveland, Darius Garland and Karis LeVert were the dominant scoring options. Now, in Utah, there isn't a star or dominant scorer on the roster, which in result almost forces the Jazz to heavily rely on ball movement to get the easiest shot possible. And that's exactly why there's six in the NBA in assists per game as a team. The second biggest component to his success, attitude. He is now far more aggressive as a player. He's now looking to shoot or score on every possession. And much credit should go to their brilliant head coach, Will Hardy. Hardy is making sure the ball gets in Laurie's hands as much as possible. Whether he's screening and rolling, screening and popping out to three, or simply just feeding him down in the high or low post and letting him make the play. But of course, a lot of credit goes to Laurie as well. He might just be the best cutting big man in the entire NBA. He's always looking to slip past defenders whenever they're asleep, and his ability to make crafty finishes around the basket makes it even more difficult to contain him. All in all, the biggest thing for him is consistency. If he can keep shooting lights out and slashing to the rim with efficiency, then the Jazz will be a serious team in the conference. And we're not saying they're title contenders by any means, but if he can keep up this great play along with the help of his supporting cast, we wouldn't be surprised to see them make it as a first round playoff team and one of the most surprising teams in the NBA this year. Did you enjoy this video? If so, you will surely enjoy our most recent videos. So subscribe to NBA Swish for more amazing NBA content just like this. Take care and we'll see you in the next one.